Farm Report presents Bargaining Power for the Dairy Farmer with Alvin Rust, head of the NFO Dairy Commodity Department, and Oris Canerva, farmer and member of the National Board of Directors from Minnesota. The U.S. Farm Report is being brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. NFO, Collective Bargaining for Agriculture, the economic keystone of America. Here is Alvin Rust and Oris Canerva on Bargaining Power for the Dairy Farmer. Bargaining Power for the Dairy Farmer. <clears throat> Bargaining Power for Dairy Farmers can be obtained on several levels. Actually, dairy bargaining and bargaining for uh, better prices for dairy farmers can take pl place first on the processing level or it can be used on the farm level itself. However, I'm going to spend a few minutes on talking of bargaining on the uh, plant level rather than the farm level itself. One of the th basic things I think the American dairy farmer should understand is that his dairy group that he is marketing through today could become a part of any dairy group or any number of dairy groups and these groups as groups could bargain for higher prices on the production they represented if the block of production they represented were large enough so that the large volume buyers would have to come to this particular block to deal for its supplies. On those bases, we all know that any company, any business group, anyone in the buying and selling field works on a volume basis. This we as farmers can do also, but it can be done the easiest from the plant level. Why hasn't it worked from this level in the past? <clears throat> One of the big faults of bargaining from the plant level has been that the individual selling groups have been in competition with one another. Makes no difference where they're located or how much volume they represent as long as the independent groups stay small and do not work with one another in a buying and selling program, they'll have to contend with the prices they're getting today. But certainly the large volume buyers of butter, cheese, and whole milk well know that if the farm cooperatives have selling and handling dairy products were to sit down around the bargaining table, and all shoot for the same goals, the same goals on prices, grades, standards, and qualities, that these could be had almost overnight. The laws setting this type of bargaining up for farmers basically has been on the books since 1922. The big problem has been to find some way, some means, to get the independent farm group to recognize that the problem they have as an individual producing group is the same problem that the group lying next to it has. It's the same problem, for example, in Wisconsin that it is in Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Ohio, Michigan, makes little difference where you would move in the dairy industry. The same thing applies. We in NFO many times have mentioned marketing agencies in common. These marketing agencies are not something new to the dairy industry as a whole. They're something that the dairy industry has used in large numbers, but with small volumes behind each independent group. As we see the groups welding themselves closer together through our efforts of signing contracts, and putting the necessary agreements down on paper so that each group becoming a part of a larger bargaining association or selling unit, that these groups all abide by the same standards of buying and selling and thereby set up business practices much as we see handled on other commodities sold to farmers or the general public as a whole. The big reason we feel 
that farmers should become part of a marketing agency is quite basic. <clears throat> we as farm groups have stayed as independent producers representing our local cooperative structures. These structures in turn have stayed pretty much as they were set up 30 years ago. While big business, the people buying and selling to the American consumer have coordinated their buying efforts throughout the nation. And it now has run to the point of where we have eight very large dairy buying concerns that do buy and market between 30 and 35 percent of all the grade A milk sold to the American public each day or each week. These big eight have to buy the volume they need from somewhere between 750 and 800 individual selling groups or producer groups. It should be quite obvious for anyone to see at this point why bargaining hasn't worked on the processing level. Let's say, for example, that we had only 750 or 800 selling groups and that the Big Eight handled all the sales of the product. This would still leave the American farmer in a very weak bargaining position or his selling groups in a very weak bargaining position. Because the large volume buyers would <coughs> have a chance to pit one buyer against 100 sellers every day of the week. And if you want to multiply it a little further than that or divide it down, break it up as buying and selling patterns are set up and established today, you would find that these 750 to 800 dairy marketing groups are selling to a far larger number than what it actually looks like. Basically, there is no independent bottler or handler that takes all its supplies from one individual farm marketing group. They all try to buy from two, three, or four sources. By doing this, if one of the farm marketing groups did back out of the selling program. Naturally, the parties buying it still would not have to sit down and bargain because they could obtain the balance of their needs from the other four or five that were supplying them. <clears throat> so it, it's quite necessary for the farm marketing groups to set up buying patterns or selling patterns <clears throat> in the same sense that big business has used it. I don't want anyone to think that we in NFO are opposed to big business in this sense. We are not. We do say and we do believe that these people should buy as cheaply as they can and sell as cheaply as they can. But at the same time, we say that the American farm producer groups marketing dairy products for their stockholders should set up like selling programs <coughs> so that they also can receive a fair position in bargaining, they can receive a fair pricing structure, and assure the big volume buyers of adequate supply. Once this has been accomplished to even a reasonable degree, certainly dairy prices can be changed, and certainly they will. We in NFO have come a long ways in working with the different cooperative marketing groups in blocking production together and obtaining better prices in this form for the farmers that have become members of the organization. But on an overall basis, bargaining in the first instance should take place on the farm level. This is a business of its own. It's one that <coughs> farmers themselves can protect without necessarily asking the cooperation of the individual marketing groups that they today see as their selling units. At this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Kenerva over here to take the next step on the ladder uh, pertaining to bargaining for dairy production, uh, production produced on the farm. 
And Oris, would you explain a little bit about bargaining on the farm level, the next step below the processing level, how this could be accomplished as well as it can be accomplished on the uh, processing level? Uh, thank you, Alvin. Uh, bargaining power at the farm level would take very much the same type of application as we have already been explained here by Mr. Rust. The uh, dairy farmer and the farmer in general has for decades, for centuries, considered himself to be the rugged <coughs> individualist that could survive and would survive under all conditions. We have seen the development of bargaining power from its very infancy in the forming of our dairy cooperatives in view of the fact that we are speaking on dairy today. These dairy cooperatives were formed by individual farmers out of sheer necessity, realizing that they had reached the stage where as individuals they found it impossible to survive under the tremendous pressures that they were subjected to by the private buying concerns. It's to the eternal credit of the founders of the cooperative movement that they realized that collective bargaining, that bargaining power was necessary, and that this was available through the forming of bargaining groups that we today know as cooperatives and which have existed for the past 50 years. But let's take a look at a collective bargaining program such as proposed by the National Farmers Organization. The farmer is an individual who produces, and efficiently so, a much needed commodity that we call food, one that we all need, and one that everyone buys. We have seen the decline of the farmer's economic lot gradually, year by year, this in spite of the fact that we have had and continue to have cooperatives and other bargaining groups, but primarily cooperatives. Now then, the farmer today is being advised by the National Farmers Organization primarily that he must become part of a group that is devoted 100% to the basic principle of bargaining, or to be more specific, collective bargaining. This means that the farmer would join a bargaining group, an organization, which proposes a business-like approach to the, far the farmer's business problem. These problems we have commonly referred to as a farm problem in general, but really it breaks down to a problem faced by each individual farmer. We advocate that the farmer become part of a collective bargaining group. This collective bargaining group must be tied together by means of membership agreements, in our case, this membership agreement lasts for three years to lend stability to the organization and also to assure those people who will be buying this commodity that this farmer group is not a fly-by-night operation, but that it will stay intact and continue to <coughs> operate as long as there is business to be conducted, and certainly this will remain so as long as there are people on this earth. The farmer joins a collective bargaining group, and then he pools his production. He blocks his production together with his neighbor. He works together with his neighbor, and he must learn that the basic principle and the muscle to be found for bargaining is in the use of his production together with his neighbor. At this point, we probably come into a, maybe a slight disagreement with some people who, in the, who advocate this strong individual approach and which we have seen dismally fail in the very recent past. The farmer must work with his neighbor and his business health, his ability to survive is going to depend on how closely he is willing to work with his neighbor. Now the more Farmers get together, work together, ship together, sell together with their neighbors, and work toward this all-important fact, fact of contracts that we in the NFO advocate. In our opinion, stability in marketing and a good collective bargaining program will only come about when a sufficient number of farmers have 
understood the fact that their economic survival hinges on whether or not they are willing and capable of working together with their neighbors, then they secure contracts with the processing plants. In most cases, these plants would be cooperatives in the case of dairy. And from there then, as Mr. Rust has pointed out, this collective bargaining effort is extended even further into the area of marketing. But basically, we want to be able to get across to farmers that there is and we have had available tremendous bargaining power available only to us based on laws as was pointed out by Mr. Rust, dating back to 1922. We are encouraged in the fact that we find more and more farmers becoming cognizant of this fact and that they are not only willing to, but are becoming eager to work together. Now, we recognize that at this stage of the game, we in the dairy industry and at the producer level have become extremely aware of the fact that there have been a lot of very, very interesting things happening in the area of supply and in the pricing of these commodities. And Mr. Rust, if you please, would you care to comment on the supply situation today and what, in your opinion, is transpiring in the area of the overall supply for the dairy industry as a whole? Well, thank you, Horace. <clears throat> the dairy farmer possibly doesn't realize the drastic effect that cheap milk prices have brought about. <clears throat> I have a little clipping laying in front of me here. I'm going to read just part of it. <clears throat> in Wisconsin, the nation's number one dairy state, 14 dairymen on an average have been quitting every day. <clears throat> That report comes from H. M. Walters, head of the state office, which keeps records on farm statistics. This means that more than 5,000 herds have been liquidated in the past year. The flight from Wisconsin dairy farms is growing in the last nine months of 65. The state lost as many dairy herds as in the previous five years. This spells out quite a story if we were to dwell and spend a lot of time on it. But naturally, as the dairy farmer quits milking his cows, moves to other types of work for livelihood, naturally the overall supply of milk will shrink. Now, it used to be that the uh, recommendations on these bases were that, well, we could get rid of half the farmers and we'd still have enough production to go around. I'd like to inform the dairy farmers listening here today that Mr. Kenerva and myself just made a trip through the Southwest, and we can assure you that the supplies of milk are definitely short, and they're going to be shorter. There is a very good chance of this nation's dairy farmers not even producing enough milk so that the necessary pounds of butter will be obtained in the coming 12-month uh, period, or the necessary volumes of powder to make ice cream and that volume of milk that has to be put into cheese. And it's all come about through the lack of one specific thing, the lack of the ability for farm groups to bargain successfully for prices. Certainly we in NFO know that all local farm marketing groups want and need better income for their producers, but uh, they seem to fail to take the initiative and grasp the need that they themselves are the basic units that can start bargaining and start this picture, a uh, chain of reaction moving that could change the whole picture uh, in a very short period of time. I have another little clipping here in front of me that spells out farmers' income to get at this story of, uh, well, uh, maybe the guy's been milking 20 cows and 10 years ago they told him he should milk 40 and then he was told he should milk 60 and now it's being recommended that he should milk 100. 
Excuse me. Well, this is well and good. We have no objection to farmers becoming larger businessmen. But we do believe that the American farmer, with the very large investment he has, that the earnings from this investment and the hours worked from his family is not adequate at the present time. The figures I'm going to read you here now come from the state of Vermont. And you Midwest farmers have been told for many, many years, well, if you can't make a living producing milk here in the Midwest, uh, move to the east. That's where you get better prices and you get better income. But look here what's going on over there. <clears throat> Some Vermont dairymen have more than $100,000 invested in their farms, but are getting less than $60 per week for their labor and interest on the investment combined. Many dairymen have records showing average weekly incomes of $30 per week. This is income per hourly wage, not just for the owner of the farm or the manager, the boss or the farmer himself, but this is income for his whole family. Certainly it is not adequate to keep it on the farm. <coughs> so what's happening is they are leaving and the nation basically is running short of supplies, Mr. Kenerva, to the point that I believe that in the next few months, we may see government take a change of attitude, and certainly we believe they should. The positions they've taken in the past certainly haven't been to the interest of the producer, nor the consumer, either one. We have made specific recommendations on these points, but basically, we get back down to a point of where it is a problem for the farmer himself. So he doesn't have to go uh, to any outsider and say, well, my day's wages aren't enough. They should be left in his hands for him to uh, take in his own hands and correct. Would you agree, Mr. Rust, that we have today two factors that uh, would indicate that the farmer today has an excellent opportunity to use his bargaining power? bargaining power that he is becoming more and more aware of and becoming more and more cognizant of the fact that he needs it and he needs it now. We have two factors apparent from what has been brought up here is that there is a smaller supply than there was a year ago and that farmers are becoming more and more aware of the fact that they can do something with it. Now, we are discussing, basically, bargaining power for the dairy farmer. And what can be done to solve the problem that we are all confronted with? Would you want to comment on this, these two factors, Mr. Rust? You're talking, namely, about prices and supplies? Correct. And Yes, uh, the dairy marketing groups today, uh, ORS, could uh, well uh, increase their income per farm, uh, per hundredweight of production for the American producer. We do find that, number one, the government is quite concerned about the production figure on an overall basis. It has dropped to this point. The second thing that disturbs us in this area is the number of farms that have already gone, along with the number of head of cattle that have disappeared, uh, along with the <coughs> exodus from farms themselves. Naturally, dairying being what it is, you can't uh, take a bunch of seed out here and sprinkle it on the ground and get a new dairy cow back in production tomorrow morning or three months from now. This is a long, uh, drawn-out procedure of breeding animals and uh, getting good, efficient stock on a farm in the first place. So it takes years to build an efficient dairy producing herd. Many, many farmers spend a lifetime building a herd, for example, that will produce 500 pounds on an average. This, again, is something they cannot do overnight. But the thing of it is that as the supplies shrink, <coughs> we happened by accident uh, a week, 10 days ago to call the different department people in Washington and check out world supplies of dairy production. There's been a lot of talk about the import of cheese. It's supposed to come into the United States. This hasn't got here yet. 
the quota of something short of a million pounds of cheese was set up. The cheese has not got here. And as I read to you this morning, Ors, in the office, we're down 16% this mm. month from what we were a year ago at this time on the production of cheese. So when you move this around into your powder, butter, a whole milk block, the people uh, testifying in federal orders in the St. Louis hearing, uh, we had some remarks from people in the Chicago area. The Chicago area figures that their utilization would be up around 67% in another month. And uh, some of the handlers and bottlers coming into the St. Louis hearings testified that today they were getting 25% of the volume of milk that they actually needed. Uh, it seems quite strange that all these short supply factors can be uh, right here with us and that this thing supply and demand hasn't changed the price. I mean, we see this uh, a lot plainer than most people do moving around like we do. Uh, I'd like to insert a comment in there, if I might. Uh, would you say that uh, the price increases that we have seen, there have been some. Would you say that these are adequate, and would you say that these price increases are such that they would reflect the real application of bargaining power on the part of the farmer? Well, I would say basically uh, <laughs> the price changes we've had have changed basically because of government action at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the government this year didn't lower the uh, seasonal uh, differential. And uh, the upping of supports by Secretary Freeman, uh, this again wasn't a lowering, but an, an upping of things, uh, the pricing structure. The truth of the matter is there has been no free market change on its own. In other words, the collective bargaining principle and bargaining power itself has not been felt in the marketplace as yet. No. no. But it can be felt. It could be felt almost overnight at the present time, as we found out in our little airplane excursion, <laughs> that it doesn't take too long to run into somebody that actually needs more milk. And this being the case, uh, let's hope uh, that the cooperative selling groups, basically, and that the American farmer in general, no matter what farm organization he belongs to, that he gives second uh, thought to farm organizations, especially marketing groups and give these some serious consideration and see once how bad he would hurt himself if he became part of them. Myself, I'm sure that I, uh, at least, I'm tired of pricing my production so cheap that the neighbor has to leave the farm. You would say study the various organizations and make an intelligent choice based on the one that shows the best promise. Right. <laughs> The U.S. Farm Report has presented bargaining power for the dairy farmer with Alvin Rust, head of the NFO Dairy Commodity Department, and Oris Kenerva, farmer and member of the National Board of Directors from Minnesota. Bargaining for a price at the market is the key factor for the dairy outlook in America. The U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you by members in this area of the National Farmers Organization. For more information on the NFO meetings in your area, Contact the National Farmers Organization, Corning, Iowa. Join with the other farmers in the United States in the successful NFO Collective Bargaining Program for Agriculture. Family Farm Agriculture, the grassroots of America.